Thank you, everybody. It's great to be with you today. And this panel is focused on the role of government in advancing clinical trials and research. And we have a great group of panelists with us today. We're very excited to have uh, our group here, Stephen Becker. Uh, Dr. Becker is the director of the Office of Regenerative Medicine at the National Eye Institute at the NIH. Maria Milan, Dr. Milan is president and CEO of the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. And also Dr. Audrey Kushek, she's a scientific program manager for the Rehab Research and Development Service at the Office of Research and Development of the Department of Veterans Affairs in Washington, DC. It's great to have all of you today. Thank you for joining our panel. I appreciate your presence today. And uh, uh, I'm Anthony Atala, and I'm here at uh, the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine, where we are live streaming uh, right to you. So <clears throat> today the session is gonna have a couple of objectives. Uh, the first one is we're going to look at how government agencies can advance through funding or other mechanisms, clinical trials, and other clinical research to expand the evidence base associated with ReGentMed and cell therapies. And we would like to have also a description of other activities in terms of government agencies and about looking at how we can advance safe and effective Regen medicine and cell therapy treatments. So thank you all of our panelists again for being with us today and thank our audience for tuning in. And so now I'd like to uh, start with our, uh, just uh, if I could ask the panelists, if you could each please share some information about your organization or agency, its purpose and the work that it does to advance clinical trials and research in the field of regenerative medicine cell therapies. I would really appreciate that. So Dr. Becker, we'll start with you. Sure, my pleasure. Hi, everyone. I'm from the National Institutes of Health and uh, specifically at the National Eye Institute. But today, uh, I wanted to let everyone know that um, the National Institutes of Health is really um, taking on regenerative medicine as a coalition. Because of the 21st Century Cures Act, we've stood up a trans agency group uh, that is implementing the Regenerative Medicine Innovation Project. And uh, over the last four years, we've received $30 million specifically to advance uh, regenerative medicine into clinical trials. And so um, I'll talk a little bit more uh, later in this discussion on how we're doing that, but it's uh, in partnership with both the FDA and NIST, the standards operating uh, body. And so we're excited to be able to carry this torch and to influence uh, kind of the next generation of uh, cell therapies. Thank you, Dr. Becker. Uh, Dr. Milan, how about at your end with CIRM? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Thank you for inviting us. So um, CIRM is, is um, a state agency that was created in 2004 by a $3 billion bond initiative um, specifically to advance and fund stem cell regenerative medicine research, as well as what's called vital research opportunities included in that is gene therapy. And most recently, some of our programs um, in the fight against COVID. Um, our portfolio that has um, ensued from that uh, bond initiative is composed of over a thousand programs being funded in discovery, translational and clinical research including uh, 64 mostly first in human clinical trials addressing 35 different types of untreatable disease. It's a very diverse portfolio of different types of cell therapies and gene therapies. We also fund infrastructure programs like specialized clinical network, a genomics data hub, an induced pluripotent stem cell bank for, for uh, cell modeling and drug discovery and manufacturing regulatory and clinical operations support. Um, all of this is intended to work together to build an ecosystem and create connectivity to other um, entities uh, to advance this field and to grow this field with the ultimate goal of accelerating um, treatments to patients with unmet medical needs. And I can describe a little bit more later in terms of how we do all that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. appreciate it. And Dr. Kushek, uh, how about at your end with the Veterans Affairs? 
Yes, thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Um, the Department of Veterans Affairs, mission, the primary mission is to serve those who served our nation. That means our veterans. Our program is to discover knowledge and it, go, it ranges from preclinical all the way up to health services research. Um, VA is the largest healthcare system in the nation and we serve over 9 million veterans. Our portfolio is mainly focused on neuromusculoskeletal and um, organs that have been injured due to um, trauma and or diseases. And um, our entire portfolio runs from everything from preclinical, as I mentioned. And because we are a healthcare system, we go all the way up until health services research. Mean, that means, um, population, demographics, healthcare services, and implementation of potential therapies, including cell therapies into our um, VA standard of care. Thank you. Thank you so much. So maybe we can talk a little bit more about what sort of funding is provided and for what types of therapies in each of your areas. I'm sure the audience would appreciate a little, a little bit of description on that. Um, Steve, could you uh, give us some details on that? Sure. So as kind of the largest biomedical research funder, uh, we do everything from preclinical to clinical research in our individual institutes. Um, there are specific programs that each institute has to focus on either the basic translational or clinical aspects. Um, and we've been recently trying to uh, leverage each other's, uh, you know, strengths and networks. So um, with the recent addition of congressional funding, um, we've been tasked to really accelerate the uh, pipeline for clinical research. And so in the last uh, two or three years, we've awarded um, uh, from eight to 12 uh, preclinical or clinical trial grant um, that specifically uh, hope to catalyze the field. So um, a lot of the techniques that are being tested either in large animals or the uh, approaches of using tissue engineering uh, techniques, um, we hope will have a broader effect than just the individual uh, subspecialties they might be operating in. And so we're hoping to disseminate these findings and we were fostering a uh, kind of, again, an ecosystem where we can share these best practices. One of the things that we're doing is requiring our grantees to submit their uh, cell sources and their final cell products for in-depth cell characterization. That will go into a database that will be shared and be open to the public and, and other researchers in a few years once that data is collected. We're just now uh, uh, introducing the, uh, the funding opportunities and the providers to do that service for our grantees. But we expect that having that in-depth cell characterization in the future might allow correlation to the outcomes of some of these clinical trials. And so we're excited to provide that framework and that model going forward to the uh, community. And we look forward to working with others to expand upon it. Thank you so much. Maria, how about at your end with CIRM? So first I wanna um, uh, leverage off of what uh, Steve was just talking about. And I think it's wonderful. I think we're seeing um, this uh, with the 21st Century Cures Act and the um, progress that's going on in the field that this idea of being able to, um, to uh, collaborate and um, uh, join efforts so that we can take, turn data into knowledge and then advance the field, I think is a really important point. Um, in fact, we have a um, partnership with the NHLBI Institute of the NIH uh, to co-fund and co-manage um, programs in cell and gene therapy for the Cure, Cure Sickle Cell Initiative, which is, you know, a, an important demonstration of how we can leverage the um, experience and resources of both um, agencies to advance this. Um, 
So um, going back to the question um, of, can you repeat the question again, Anthony? <laughs> how do we do? <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> <Yes>. I just <laughs> wanted to make that point okay. because I think one of the things that I, I, I think that we really should be uh, wary of is how we use public funds and how we can make, make sure that we use it most responsibly and not duplicate and not be at cross purposes. So I really wanted to emphasize that point, but let me answer the specific question. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Marie. And basically what sort of funding is provided by CIRM and for what type of therapies basically? Okay, great. Okay, thank you so much. So I mentioned in the introduction that we, um, we fund a, a very diverse um, uh, portfolio of programs, although they're stem cell regenerative medicine and gene therapy programs, they are uh, targeting over 35 different types of indications from rare disease to more common diseases such as diabetes, um, rare genetic diseases, some of our programs that are the furthest along our uh, gene correction, our gene addition for metabolic disorders um, or immune deficiencies in children. Um, so there, it's very diverse, um, but I think that one thing that is um, really unique about our, our uh, funding uh, model is that it is designed to accelerate. So it's a continuous recurrent and predictable funding model where for instance, for clinical stage programs, um, the, it's essentially an open application where monthly applications are um, accepted and then they go to review within a span of two months and that just goes on a continual basis. But the things that get into the clinical stage may have started in discovery stage programs. So um, the cool thing about the, the funding opportunities are always open. And what happens is that a successful uh, discovery candidate discovery program would then tee up that program um, to provide the data and the requirements to then be eligible for a translational program. And then the translational type grants really are specifically geared toward um, making sure that that project, if successful, would be ready to submit an I in, uh, um, a, 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 a pre-IND and then go into the clinical one program where the objective is to get an IND and then it goes to the clinical two program. And so because it's, it's kind of very um, uh, specific in terms of what the requirements are and it, um, it aligns with what the regulatory path is and the requirements to get it to clinical trials, um, we can also um, have uh, milestone-based uh, grant payments so it keeps folks on track and sometimes things don't work out. And when they don't, the money can come back and re be redeployed to another type of program or maybe that program that comes back with a different, um, with a different plan based on what they, you know, what they experienced and improvements. So that's um, one aspect that's, that's, that's um, unique. Another aspect of it is there, there is our revenue sharing provisions to our uh, grants so that, um, successful uh, programs that then go on and that we do hope that they go on to uh, commercialization partnerships approval um, because that's the way they reach patients. When they do that, once they start um, uh, getting revenue, a portion of that will go back to the state um, or they could actually pay off the loan and then that can come back and uh, be used for other research programs. Uh, so with that, we funded a very diverse uh, number of uh, research programs all the way through. We have some mature programs, a handful that are now in the pivotal stage. So it's really exciting with these uh, first in kind type technologies addressing um, fatal and unmet medical needs. Um, well, you know, one of the things I wanted to say, and then I'll stop is that we, while we all while we fund, we actually have um, programs in place that we're partnering all the way across. We have advisory panels um, that are not adjudication panels, but they are meant to be enabling panels to help the grantees overcome hurdles or um, address issues and help them out because when we choose these programs, they've gone through a rigorous peer review process and they were evaluated to be very promising. So certainly we wanna make sure that we do whatever we can uh, for them to be successful. Thank you so much, Maria, I appreciate it.
And Audrey, what about at your end? What sorts of funding are provided and what, for what types of therapies? So I'm gonna piggyback off of my two colleagues. Thank you for introducing everything that we, we, we also do at the VA. Um, we, like I mentioned, we, our funding mechanisms are very similar to those of NIH. Um, we stress translation just as um, Dr. Milan said. And you know, everything that we do is based on service directed types of injuries as well as um, the, the lifespan of the veteran and what the health problems that they also um, encounter due to military exposure, due to their injuries, et cetera. So everything that we do is based on the, the life-term health care of the veteran. So if you're talking about trauma, we're looking at neuromusculoskeletal, as I said, but also in terms of their um, whole body and mental health. So we span everything, like I mentioned earlier, all the way up until the healthcare, but with a huge emphasis on translation, we fund a lot of large animal studies in terms of a lot of the musculoskeletal issues, such as osteoarthritis, as well as neuro, neurological problems like traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, et cetera. Thank you so much. I would like to reach out to our audience and, pl and please let them uh, know at this point, if you want to submit your questions, please send them to www.slido.com. That's S-L-I-D-O. That's S as in Sam, S L as in Lima, I, D as in David, O.com. And the hashtag is uh, uh, T as in Tom 992. So please send your questions in to the chat room and we will be able to get to those at the, uh, towards the end of this session. Thank you. So we'll go back now to uh, Stephen. Uh, Stephen, if you could please uh, let us uh, know beyond funding research, what other activities uh, do you uh, perform and undertake to advance the field of regen med and cell therapies through your agency? Sure, I can give an example of what the National Eye Institute recently has uh, set up. We're excited about a partnership with the New York Stem Cell Foundation in which we, uh, through a contract, we uh, utilized our um, age-related macular degeneration uh, cohort that we had studied for nearly a decade and derived uh, stem cells from them. And so now we have a resource that we hope the community can utilize, uh, much like uh, CIRM's efforts, um, to uh, model disease using human tissue and try to get at the uh, causes of both the disease and uh, finding uh, attempts to treat it. And so uh, we uh, are, have released, uh, I think, almost a dozen lines so far, and in the next um, three months, we're expecting an additional almost 60 lines. And these are available both to academic and commercial entities. Um, and so uh, we're hoping that that'll catalyze um, uh, research. And we're hoping that uh, that model can be extended to other diseases, not just um, age-related macular degeneration, but we have a, a history through our clinical center of other rare and inherited uh, eye diseases, and those we can also derive uh, stem cells from and make such resources available to uh, researchers. Uh, we're also um, trying to provide um, with the Office of Regenerative Medicine at uh, the National Institute to um, resources in terms of funding opportunities across uh, both NIH and the federal government so that everyone's aware of uh, what funding is available, including funding for perhaps manufacturing difficulties. Uh, there are a number of, of needs that we're uh, uh, cataloging through uh, strategic planning that all the institutes are undertaking now. And so we're hoping to uh, address kind of each of those with specific perhaps funding opportunities or programs that can again accelerate uh, 
Good. Thank you, Stephen. And Maria, how about Aguirin? I know that CERM is, of course, doing a lot of other things other than just funding. How do you uh, promote these other activities uh, to support regen med and cell therapies? Thank you. Um, similar to what Steve had described, uh, CIRM formed what's called a, an induced pluripotent stem cell bank with over 2,000 disease lines as well as control lines. And um, for, um, for study of disease as well as uh, that's available to academic um, investigators as well as to commercial entities. And so that's one of the ways, there's also the genomics hub that we've created. And we recently uh, announced a partnership with the Jan Zuckerberg Initiative for single cell analysis, specifically related to our COVID program that we launched um, in response to the crisis. Um, and in addition to that, we um, also are very involved in um, making sure that we um, educate the public via our um, annual meetings. We had recently just had a, a public meeting, a two day, um, all day meeting where it was over 500 um, members of the public and the scientific community had attended where we can update the public on the progress of the science, what, what makes um, uh, a potential sci scientific discovery something that could potentially go into patients, how far along they really are, what are the considerations, both scientific, medical, but also social. Um, we have incorporated under the leadership of our board, specifically Isabel Duran uh, on our board, um, in our funding mechanism, a uh, provision so that we can make sure our researchers and our clinical researchers take into account proportional representation and making sure that we reach the underserved and those affected with our COVID programs, as well as um, all of the other um, now uh, programs that are coming in for uh, grant funding. Um, we have published some white papers, but I've also uh, worked with our state legislature in terms of um, passing um, legislation. We didn't pass it, but we advised in terms of um, uh, how we can help the public understand what therapies have gone through um, the FDA regulatory path versus those that haven't received um, um, approval because there is this um, issue that we're facing while there's been progress in the field and the science and promise for regenerative medicine. Unfortunately, as we all know, we're dealing with this issue of uh, direct to consumer stem cell tourism. Um, and so we're doing what we can to educate, but also um, working with our policy um, colleagues to figure out how to in best inform the public. Um, so those, those are just a few things. And then I, I mentioned the idea of connecting with industry. Cannot stress that if we don't have the appropriate partnership with the industry, we will not be able to get these therapies to patients. No matter how excellent the science is, no matter how much progress is happening, if the manufacturing is not worked out, if we can't reliably and predictably make the product so that the FDA can be convinced that this is you know, something that they can feel uh, could be um, released for general um, broad use, then we're nowhere. The science is just going to sit there um, and, and sit in papers. So we um, have embedded within our funding, within the types of um, considerations that our review team, that our review reviewers look at, that our board looks at in terms of uh, funding programs. We make sure that they're feasible, that they're aligned with what it would take to make its way down the development path and to get to the clinics. We all know that a major issue, and it was alluded to uh, on, uh, in the earlier panels as well as this panel, the major thing is going to be um, manufacturing. And so, it, you know, the, the idea of making sure that we have the cells well characterized, that we make sure that we can really look at um, how uh, the data is being looked at, both clinical data and how it correlates with the product is gonna be essential. And that is gonna require, it has required funding that will continue to require funding. I think there's great promise and progress, but to really um, bring this forward, we're gonna to need to have a, a collaborative effort in the field that is going to be um, uh, something that the NIH is working toward as well. But we, we are very aware of that. And we, um, in our own uh, portfolio, 
are working toward um, enhancing some of the collaboration and the cross learning that's already happening. And hopefully we'll be able to formalize that um, even more. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And, and what you said is so important. You know, there's so many other factors, of course, that are needed to move these therapies forward. And uh, thank you for what you're doing over at CERM. And uh, Stephen, same at your end. Uh, Audrey, how about it uh, from the Veterans Affairs angle? So, how can um, we, what other uh, activities are so, you undertaking? Um, the, the VA, we have, as Maria already mentioned, um, so we have our Million Veteran Program, which is our genomic program, and we are um, currently enrolling, our goal is to enroll 1 million veterans. It's similar to um, NIH's All of Me or, uh, program. And so we have that. We also have tissue and blood banks. And um, we are with our fellow um, sister agencies, as well as with CIRM, uh, participating on the National Academy of Sciences Regenerative Medicine Forum. And um, I'm just put a plug in for that on October 22nd to the 23rd, there's gonna be a public workshop on exploring systems thinking approaches to developing and manufacturing regenerative medicine therapies. Um, we are also interacting with our other federal agencies, especially at the Department of Defense. Um, several of our, um, my, my colleagues are on several of their review boards and we interact very closely to make sure that we have no overlap in funding as well as complementing our, our regenerative, regenerative medicine efforts. Um, we also provide outreach at meetings such as the Society for Neuroscience and the Orthopedic Research Society uh, meetings. Um, the last thing I'd like to mention that I didn't mention previously is that the VA is an intramural research program. So you should be, or you must be a VA researcher um, affiliated with a VA medical center in order for you to apply for our funding mechanisms. So um, just letting you know right now, thanks. That's great, thank you. That's very important, of course, because I know that you have to be part of the VA system to apply for these uh, funding mechanisms. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay, I just want to remind again our audience members to, if you have any questions at all for our panelists, please go to www.slido.com. That's www.sierra-lima-india-delta-oscar.com and put in hashtag Tango992, that's T as in tango, 992, hashtag T as in tango, 992. We'll get to your questions towards the end of the panel. So back to Stephen. Stephen, you know, you've talked, we've talked about the funding that you're doing. We've talked about some of the programs that you're doing, other things that you're doing in the field. Can you describe the impact that your organization has had on the field? What has the agency been able to do to move the field forward? Well, you know, for specifically for the um, for regenerative medicine in the eye, we're really pleased to have kind of uh, provided that basic seed money and those R01 grants to a lot of the researchers uh, who have gotten now into uh, clinical trials. A, lot, a couple of them, of course, are funded by partners like CERM. And we're trying now at the uh, Eye Institute to think about um, what are the next steps. So in our intramural program, we are excited that uh, this year we announced our, uh, one of our uh, intramural researchers is starting a trial uh, for uh, a specific retinal pigmented epithelium transplantation in patients. And we see for the Eye Institute, um, you know, in the next five to 10 years, as part of our uh, regenerative medicine programs, we really want to expand upon that technique and uh, start transplanting other different uh, types of cells, the retinal neurons, which are gonna require an understanding of the circuitry and the integration into a complex visual system in order to be functional. And so we're laying down that foundation uh, to be able to do that by uh, having enabling technologies, first of all, to assess whether the cells are there and in sufficient numbers. So 
So we need the imaging techniques and methodology to be worked out. We also need more of the biology to be worked out, both at the individual cell level and at the kind of network synaptic level in order to ensure that those uh, cells, once put in there, actually integrate into their host systems and circuitry. Uh, we're also leveraging the brain initiative that uh, has been well-funded for uh, many years now that are implementing new tools and technologies in order to both image and assess function in uh, the visual system as well as the larger uh, brain neural networks. Uh, the, and then finally, you know, there's translational animal models that need to be developed. A lot of our work when we first started was in mouse, and there's just inherent difficulties in that translational, uh, you know, research that needs to be done into humans. So we're funding more non-human primate uh, research to try to develop models and try to uh, verify techniques that hopefully hold more fidelity to the human system before we try uh, things in humans. Uh, so we have uh, a lot of work to do, but we're putting together the pieces now and we're putting together more workshops and avenues like town halls at different professional society meetings to get inputs from the community and to uh, guide, you know, the best science we can. Thank you. Dr. Becker. Uh, Maria, any, uh, how about from the CIRM angle? Uh, can you describe the impact that CIRM has had on the field? Um, I think that, you know, of course, we're going to say we, we, we had um, a major impact on the field because we were specifically um, formed to advance stem cell regenerative medicine. And it was formed in 2004. And at that time, there wasn't much of a field. And so I think collectively as a community that we've helped mature the field and again, in partnership with other um, agencies. But I, one of the things that's unique to CIRM is it was, I call a special purpose funding vehicle specifically for this technology platform or this family of, of technology platforms. So um, one of the, the benefits of that is similar to how sometimes um, technology may go to a company and then get dropped you know, prematurely um, and not make it to patients, even if it's promising. I think one of the major benefits of having that type of funding mechanism is that you have patient investors, patient meaning that they're waiting to see if this, you know, where the science is playing out. We de-risk programs when they're unable to get traditional funding um, because maybe they don't meet the usual criteria for some of the funding mechanisms that are out there or that companies just aren't willing to take a risk on programs that are too early. So what I think the, 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 um, the value that CIRM has brought is because it was specifically formed by the citizens of California to take that risk and, um, we were able to uh, fund programs. Many of that, many of these programs started in the in the academic labs. Some of them were based on principles that, at the time that they were being investigated, were still you know held to be um, not really accepted by the scientific community, such as the concept of cancer stem cells, for instance. It was highly controversial, but it led to um, characterization and um, discoveries that then led to programs that are now in the late stage of clinical trials. So those programs and the investigators themselves have said were rejected by traditional investors, uh, I mean, by traditional um, um, uh, funders, because they just at that point were seen to be not enough um, they weren't mature enough or they weren't fitting into what um, the reviewers may be more comfortable with. So CIRM um, funded those type of programs and they played out uh, really well in terms of being able to show benefit in initial trials to patients and now we're moving along. So I think demonstration um, of that type of model where you can de-risk programs early, take the risk as long as it's based on science, on solid science, as long as you're tracking it along the way to, that they meet um, you know, the uh, requirements that you would need to be able to move it along in the translational path into clinical trials. And then the rigorous you know, um, collection of the data to drive 
um, evidence base um, that would then bring that to patients. I think that model, it's not new to CERM, obviously, the NIH has been in this business for a very long time, but I think the idea of having it be very focused and specialized really helps because there are the, the folks who are all involved, the advisors, the, the, um, the investigators themselves, they're all kind of in it together. We're all in it together. And so what happens is there's a kind of a shared learning that happens and shared experiences. And then that the, uh, the, um, um, the academic investigators as they're moving along are um, really assisted in terms of this very new pathway to them. They're not, this is not, you know, most of them have didn't get trained in terms of how to write an IND or how to figure out, you know, what the requirements would be to bring this forward. And so to have a community where you do have um, just a diverse and heterogeneous um, um, uh, grouping of specialization to help them along the way has been really valuable. So um, one of the things that, you know, we do is we, we actually measure outcomes to, to see how we're doing. And we launched a strategic plan five years ago under um, uh, Randy Mills, who was my predecessor at CIRM. I was on his team. We launched a strategic plan five years ago where we said, we're gonna measure how we're doing in terms of building a portfolio, how we're accelerating programs and how this is looking in terms of, does this um, attract uh, uh, industry investment? Because as I said, that's critical. And um, measuring those were in the year five of the strategic plan, we have, essentially met all those um, goals, which we set as extremely bold goals. We partnered over 50% of our programs with industry. We built our portfolio of clinical trials by almost 50 more trials um, to get to 64. We have um, now a lot of our programs who are coming in um, specifically to file on IND have been able to do it within 18 months with a very strong package um, and achieve an IND. So, so by kind of measuring what we're doing by being really focused in terms of, 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 of um, the types of technology platforms that we are supporting. And then by having it all be under the umbrella of a single mission, which is to accelerate these, uh, the science and these treatments to patients with unmet medical needs by just that very, very um, um, you know, important mission-driven approach I think that, that, that we've been able to measure outcomes even over the past five years that have demonstrated that this acceleration model, and by the way, along the way, we've made um, improvements to this based on what we were seeing, um, that, it, that it's working. And it's been really wonderful to also partner um, with another, with an NHLBI specifically to deploy this model and, and to see it work. And I think that that's been um, a wonderful, um, demonstration of how, yes, it's being done in California, but it benefits more broadly. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Marie. And, I, and of course, I know that Proposition 14 is in California is currently in the ballots uh, to add more funding to CIRM for about five and a half billion dollars. Uh, so that's a, a good initiative at this point that's in front of the voters of, uh, of California. So we look forward to seeing what happens with with that, and I hope you're successful in that next phase. Um, so, uh, Dr. Kushek, how about from the uh, VA side? Uh, can you describe the impact that your organization or agency has had on the, that uh, you've had in the field from the VA? Yeah, so the impact is, is I would say, um, several pronged. The first impact that we've um, established is is using a team-based approach and leveraging funding from other agencies, including CIRM and NIH. Um, many of our investigators have dual hats. They are VA investigators, but they're also um, working at their academic affiliate at the university. So they can you know, readily apply to other agencies for funding. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we really want to translate our therapies from animal models into the humans. And so we've also tried to look at this from the top down approach and looking from the humans back down to the animals, so reverse translation. So with this, we've developed 
of certain types of concepts such as regenerative rehabilitation, how can we strengthen the connections formed by the cells? How, how, how can we help them integrate into the, um, into the um, wound or into the area? Um, and how can we prehabilitate people so that if they have not been in a position or in a physical state where they can actually benefit and from long-term regenerative therapies, how can we prehabilitate them so that we can make them much more amenable in terms of their physical status, et cetera, to you know, receiving therapies and making them much more inclusive in terms of an inclusive inclusive population that would be amenable to, to therapies. Last of all, I think that the VA, because we are a healthcare system, we can do a lot in terms of the back end and in terms of what happens after therapies have been implanted or transplanted. How long do we have to monitor individuals? Um, since we provide care for the rest of the lives of our veterans, we can actually do something like this that most other institutions cannot. So we can answer some tail end questions that, um, you know, regular funding, regular hospitals, et cetera, probably would not be able to because if you wanna look at 10, 15, 20 years out, that would be extremely costly, but that's already built into our system. Thank you. Thank you so much. We only have about five more minutes before we go into our Q&A with the audience. So this last question, if you could please answer succinctly in about a, in a one minute answer. And that is, you know, today we're talking about a full range of regenerative medicine therapies and products. And we were talking about mesenchymal stem cells, other types of stem cells, tissue engineering, natural killer cells. So do you have a sense of why federal funding for cell therapies is still fairly limited. Dr. Becker? Well, I, I, you know, our, we try to fund the best science and uh, we're doing that through all our different institutes. We have NCATS with a tissue chip program. We've accelerated a lot of uh, different areas. And uh, once it gets, you know, that rigorous uh, proof of concept um, going, you know, that uh, hopefully will attract more investment. And so uh, the Regenerative um, Medicine Innovation Project uh, has a different funding model similar to, to CIRMS where we actually have uh, federal funding matched one for one. And so that, again, gets that buy-in from other uh, stakeholders to carry it through through that translational uh, research uh, and clinical trial uh, phase. And we're hopeful that, you know, that's a, that's a model that can spur um, the whole field. And so we're hoping that our money can be leveraged in all these other forms that we've discussed. And so uh, we're hoping Congress will renew uh, some more uh, funding for this regenerative medicine program so we can continue to do so. Terrific. Thank you. Maria, also briefly, can you... Uh, Tell us, please, your thoughts on, on that. Why, why do we have uh, such a limit in terms of federal funding for these therapies? I, I think, I, you know, I, I don't know if I can speak on behalf of federal funding agencies, but, um, you know, I think one of the, um, some of the, some of the points that I brought up earlier is that the type of things that we need funded are not traditional type of research programs. So translational type research, manufacturing sciences, even data sciences, or what Audrey brought up, real world evidence, or you know, the type of research that takes into account the impact on patients, you know, when they're out in the real world and determining you know, similar to um, the, making sure that we um, reach all patients, uh, diverse population and representative patients. What we wanna continue to do is improve on our clinical sciences so that when we design our trials, for instance, that we really do represent what the, the population could look like within the limits of what, you know, clinical trial design, but taking that into account. So these are the type of things that, some, that often, you know, don't really, uh, meet 
the um, criteria of what's often called a, a rigorous peer review, because often that is based on, um, you know, papers, scientific, mechanistic, hypothesis driven, you know, basic science, which is ex absolutely essential because good medicine starts with solid science. But it's a really um, new area that we're all trying to navigate together, all the funding agencies and scientists in terms of determining how do we evaluate the best plans. Um, I think one thing we can start with is acknowledging. I think it's this concept that I heard, um, you know, in, it's really succinctly put, which is how do we get all this massive amounts of data we're getting from the clinical trials, from all of our you know, from all the different research programs, from all of us, from the VA program and all that. How do we take all that um, and, and um, create knowledge out of it? And so it's on multiple levels, but when we talk about clinical trials, for instance, um, even there, there's so many different efforts where there's some promising data, but how do we combine forces so that we can make sense of that data and create knowledge to go to the next, because it's not often that you get a home run. Anyway, I know I've exceeded my time. I see you're plaquing. So data science is I think gonna be. Thank you so much. And Audrey, also in just one minute or less, can you tell us what is your sense with all these new therapies out there? Uh, do you have a sense of why federal funding for cell therapies is fairly limited? So my opinion is I don't think it's fairly limited. I think there's a good pot of money out there. But going back to what Maria said, rigorous, well-designed, meritorious science. And that's what we fund. And so it comes back down to review and it comes back down to how everything is written and put into the application. If something is meritorious, yes, it's going to get through the system. But if it's not, then you know, it's probably not going to get through the system. And I also think that the same thing is also much, you know, much in play for NIH too. We fund meritorious science. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, now we're going to go for a Q&A with our audience members. And again, I would like to remind our audience, the link is working. You just can go to www.slido.com. That's www.sierralimaindiadeltaoscar.com and enter hashtag T is in Tango 992. Hashtag T is in Tango 992. And we do have already some questions from our audience members for our panelists. And so first question for our panelists. Are the, is there any support from agencies right now as it relates to regenerative medicine for COVID? Who would like to take that question? Stephen, anything at the NIH from this send using regen med specific research for COVID? There's a variety of, of COVID um, related funding opportunities. And if stem cell technology can be applied to it, you know, it goes through all those uh, different programs that Congress uh, gave us money for. So there, you know, we're, we're kind of agnostic to the approach. Uh, I don't think there's anything specifically targeting it, but I know uh, applications are currently uh, being reviewed that are employing a variety of approaches, including regenerative medicine ones. Thank you, Stephen. Audrey, anything at your end from the VA? or COVID-related research as it relates to RegenMed? Yes, um, we have been, uh, we have special RFAs out right now. And um, I have seen, well, maybe not for my portfolio in particular, but we have seen some um, applications coming in to repair the lung, for example, using regenerative medicine approaches. Terrific, thank you. Maria, how about with SERM? So when we went into lockdown um, here in California, um, we almost immediately, uh, you know, went into conversations with our scientific advisors and our board and, and, and um, determined, and our scientists, and determined that because of the funding that we created, there was a significant body of, uh, of work that was done that would be relevant potentially to, tar to battling COVID. So we opened the program announcement with the, you know, with 
with the remaining amount of funds we had left in our research budget. And we um, deployed $5 million, which was not a lot considering that a typical award for a clinical trial, for instance, in our standard funding was is between 10 and 15 million, but $5 million. And we had a remarkable response to that. And, and based on that program announcement, we were able to bring in some highly rigorously reviewed um, programs where we funded 17 um, COVID programs, three of them in clinical trials. Uh, the three clinical trials, one um, is related to characterizing um, the, the uh, convalescent plasma, which we've heard a, a lot about in terms of um, uh, you know, some uh, potential therapeutic um, effect, but this program seeks to look at um, kind of a, a more deep characterization of the plasma, um, as well as making sure that the program, the clinical program gets to the, to the um, affected communities. Um, the second program is a stem cell derived NK cell. As we know, the immune system is knocked down early in, in COVID. Um, including NK cells. And this program leverages some of the early um, science and, 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 and um, experience with um, in cancer um, to, toward COVID. And the third program is an MSC based program that leverages a, a program that CIRM had been funded, CIRM, the DOD and the NIH had funded uh, Dr. Mathay's program um, with MSC for ARDS. And this is um, they've already, I think, um, enrolled over 20 patients in that program. The majority of them are, um, are with COVID. And then the rest of the programs are earlier stage programs looking at novel vaccine development, as well as uh, um, targeting other manifestations of COVID, such as diaphragmatic atrophy related to uh, the ventilator and things like that, you know, where regenerative medicine would be relevant. So with a limited amount of funding we had, we were able to bring in these, these high quality programs that are really seeking um, to, um, to apply the previously gained knowledge, use model systems and clinical data from other indications toward COVID. Uh, so we've been very uh, encouraged by, by that particular um, effort. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, another question from one of our audience members, how can patient advocates play a role in your different organizations? Uh, Dr. Becker? Well, you know, there's a lot of forums that we have where we solicit opinions of the public, including, uh, you know, requests for information and open town halls at various conferences. And we welcome the perspectives of especially patient, patient advocacy groups. Um, once a year, we have uh, a meeting with a number of the uh, vision specific uh, funders uh, so that we can uh, synergize efforts. And um, I know all the various uh, institutes usually have a similar day where um, we bring together that population. Uh, NCATS houses the uh, rare diseases uh, initiative and brings together uh, a lot of uh, those groups uh, for their specific insights and, uh, and uh, advice on um, how we can proceed together. Great, thank you. Um, doc, uh, Dr. Kushiak? Um, yes, so we have a very good relationship with our veteran service organizations or VSOs. Um, we meet with them on a yearly annual basis. Sometimes we actually meet with specific um, organizations and have them over if they want to talk to us. We are welcome. We have our open doors, you know, our doors open so that we can have a good report and exchange of information. That's great. And Dr. Milan from CERM? So uh, patient advocates are essentially embedded in everything that we do at CIRM. Um, we have 10 uh, patient advocates on our board, uh, plus our chair and vice chair. We have seven patient advocates that serve on our peer review panel. They don't do the, um, they don't do the vote on the ultimate uh, scientific scoring, 
but they're involved in the programmatic consideration, especially when it go, gets to the board level. So they're actually at the reviews and then they're able to bring that knowledge and insight when, when the board makes a final um, um, funding decision. We have, I mentioned earlier, clinical advisory panels and translational advisory panels that have our CIRM program officers, um, external experts from manufacturing, regulatory sciences, uh, and, and specific specialties that are relevant to those particular programs, as well as there's at least one patient representative on every one of those advisory panels. And that is absolutely critical. I mean, there are things that come up that we as the, the funders or the scientists or the, even the clinicians don't think about that are absolutely critical and could be the Achilles heel for how a program could move forward. So um, they, are, you know, they are critical to the, the entire machinery. And so, uh, and, and in fact, CIRM was formed because of patient advocacy. So it, it is appropriate that in fact, that, that it really uh, sticks to that mission for the patients, but that the patient uh, advocates are involved all the way through. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So another question from one of our audience members, there's, you know, for a clinical trial to have statistical significance, typically they require hundreds of patients once they get a little bit more advanced. And apart from agencies such as uh, CIRM, uh, you know, funding trials, which are tens of millions of dollars is difficult to do. So what other federal sources are there, if any, available to fund these types of trials? Uh, Stephen? Well, I mean, all the From institutes the have clinical um, funding opportunities and, um, you know, the uh, regenerative medicine innovation program that I mentioned, uh, the last two funding opportunities specifically have focused on clinical trial funding. Um, and so uh, that uh, emphasis uh, has been made. Uh, previously, we wanted the pre-IND enabling um, awards, and now we, we've been focusing on clinical trials. And so um, those... Uh, I think funding opportunities that it still is out. If you go to uh, nih.gov uh, backslash RMI, you can see uh, those funding opportunities that are part of that program. And I guess that would also apply to other sources, uh, including SBIRs and SDTRs. So this funding would be available uh, in addition to that, I would imagine, correct? Absolutely, yeah. We're agnostic through all the different mechanisms of, of, of uh, utilizing regenerative medicine approaches. And we're seeing more and more, of course, with the uh, small biotechs and companies uh, being able to commercialize these technologies. Sounds good. But will they, will they be able to fund, you think, uh, a large series, over 100 patients through these mechanisms? Yeah, there, there's many times, uh, you know, uh, in different um, institutes, more money allocated for later stage trials, you know, uh, for, for the I Institute, we're usually at phase one or phase two. Um, but uh, as the need is there, and as, as we come in, we're trying to leverage different networks. And so, you know, uh, at, we're, we're willing to entertain what's needed. Thank you. Uh, uh, Audrey, anything at your end from that perspective, from the VA, to fund these very large clinical trials that are needed for the Yes, field? we have a cooperative studies program that specializes in multi-site clinical trials. Um, they can be extremely costly, like, like um, um, Dr. Milan mentioned, tens of millions of dollars. Um, and, um, you know, 100 patients, maybe 500 patients, um, we've got several of them going on right now for different indications, not necessarily for regenerative therapies, but um, they're very costly. And uh, we have a clinical trials network built into our healthcare system and with a hub and spoke model. So yes, we are totally capable of doing something like that. Terrific, thank you. Well, this brings uh, close to our panel. 
I really would uh, like to thank all our panelists for such a wonderful uh, exposure to the field and to let us know what's going on with your agencies in terms of funding. We appreciate your participation. I would like to thank the audience for staying tuned to, to this live streaming. And of course, to our organizers who have made this uh, conference possible, uh, to uh, Janet Marge Boda, Bernie Siegel and their team for making this conference possible for us. I'd like to thank again our panelists, Stephen Becker, Maria Milan, and Audrey Kushak. Thank you all so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks so much.